Hi, right, it's a good evening from Australia to our morning listeners in the UK and uh, my co-host Andrina Forrest is currently convalescing at the moment and so she's not with us tonight but she's uh, obviously watching the show and uh, I would have to say that she's actually organised this um, beautiful soul all the way from Northern Ireland, Belfast I might, I might add, so she's had to get up early in the morning and um, I've already had people from Canada, from Vancouver, Molly's asked how do you pronounce the name, uh, and I will, <laughs> that'll be the first question I'm going to pass on <laughs> to um, Avin, I got that wrong, and, um, <laughs> and we're going to have a real, one of those nights, days, whatever you want to call it, where you go and get the fish and chips and you sit down on the beach and you just have a, a little matter about um, how you come into this world and um, how you've found your passion and lived the dream, you know, so... Um, well, good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. How are things on your side of the world? Well, we're just going into December here. So for Queensland, it's a wet season or dry season. So there's no in between. So we've had plenty of rain. And uh, I just noticed that the moon is now shining through the studio. So it's pretty nearly close to a full moon. So okay. um, we'll bring out the werewolves of um, Belfast, will we, tonight? Is that how it's going to operate? Do I look that bad? Oh, God, I, I did quite a good <laughs> job. <laughs> uh, I think it's not laughing like that. We're in for a good night. Hey, hey, so, Miss um, Spiritual Shaman, Mystic Woman, Housewife. Thing, yeah. Mother, all that, yeah, all good, eh? Chief Bottle Washer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, obviously, uh, mediumship uh, and clairvoyance, clairsentience, um, the inner journey, the dream and all that stuff, obviously kicked in um, in your childhood. And the question is, did you have the support of uh, family members to um, allow you to grow? I was very blessed because, well, now, I at the beginning, I used to get into trouble quite a bit because I picked up information from the adults and I didn't have much of a filter. So I would just come out. I'd listen to, to two adults having a conversation. And before they even got to the end of the conversation, I'd say things like, yeah, but you don't actually mean that. This is what you mean. And you, do, and you really want to say this. And um, so I learned pretty, pretty early on, Jeff, to kind of keep my mouth shut because I kept getting into trouble. <laughs> um, and I was having experiences from a very young age picking up a lot of information, not really knowing at all what it was all about, uh, feeling that it was completely wrong. And I was quite frightened as well because there was no reference point. Uh, I was brought up in the Catholic Church and this is going back a long, long time ago. Um, now, not that, that long ago, but a good few years, <laughs> good few decades ago. And you didn't speak of these types of things. And and to be honest, I didn't know how to. But as I as I matured into my twenties, my sister actually became a healer first. So she kind of pioneered the way for me. So she's um ten years older than me. So when I started really coming out and and into this world, at least I had somebody who I could go to and say, have you had this experience? Or you know, at that time I was learning about my spirit guides. I was meeting them and I was like, what is this? You know, what am I experiencing here? And I'd had quite a big awakening. I was working for a community development group. I was 21 years of age. Um, and we went to a place called Maynooth University to do a facilitation skills uh, course, two week course, residential course. And it was during that time that I had my first awakening. And I came back from that, not knowing what had actually happened. What I realized afterwards was that my pineal gland had opened. I was seeing stuff very, very clearly. It, it, basically, the trees looked like they were completely alive. I mean, I was seeing the energy in the trees. Everything looked like it had a filter taken off it. And I had an experience while I was... Uh, one evening on the course actually and I was I was in the room and I was in bed and I just felt this all-consuming love it felt like cotton wool being in lots and lots of cotton wool and lots and lots of unconditional love I never experienced anything like it so I went home from that residential weekend after having that experience and 
um, seeing all these colours that I had never seen for the first time, the way that I was seeing them, seeing life as in the birds, uh, the, the trees, the leaves, everything was really animated and not knowing what to do with this. So I went to my sister because I knew she was training as a healer. And even back then, you know, this is what, 25, 30 years ago. Yeah, maybe around that time. So that really wasn't a thing in Ireland, doing any kind of healing. And I don't even think Reiki was on the scene here at the time. She was doing collation. And I said, I've had this experience and I feel like something has really moved in me, but I don't know what it is. And she said, well, do you think it could have been your angels? And I said, you're what now? You're what? Your <laughs> angels? Do you believe in that? Are you serious? Now, we're not in church now. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so... I think it was herself who, who suggested that I went to see a, a healer called Joy. And um, when I was with Joy, we had this kind of consultation and then a meditation together. And I met my spirit guide, one of my spirit guides for the first time. And his name was Shion, S-H-I-O-N. And of course, he was the typical Native American. And I said to Joy, uh, how do I connect and you know, really blend with this person and, and get to understand what he's about and what our relationship is about. She said, go home and meditate on his name and visualize his name emblazoned when your eyes are closed before you go to sleep. So I did that. And that night I had a dream about this Native American. One of the things I forgot to say to you was that she said his eyes are really, really sparkling. He has very, there's lots and lots of laughter in his eyes. So I saw this Native American man just from the top of the head down to his chest. But the one thing that stood out was the eyes, that they were really full of laughter and fun and mischief. So that was my first real kind of experience of, of, this whole world and then bit by bit more and more came in and then memories started coming in from younger years you know yeah mm. so I did have a bit of support there yeah from your sister so yeah. how's she going how's she traveling well you know she's uh, doing the same thing as me now so so she teaches in this area also and she's a healer and she's a tarot card reader and that's her full-time work just as mine so but she's in the republic and i'm up in northern ireland yeah actually some some of our students have crossed over <laughs> <laughs> are they now yeah hey, um i noticed on your um facebook page you've got some really interesting um, f photos i mean um two that i want to bring up this one here oh yeah <laughs> yeah that's so pronounced and so it's, it is really a hard, difficult slog, isn't it, for someone to come onto this planet and um, bring their gifts through, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And squeeze yourself into a tiny physical body, like the size of a baby, and to get all that energy and all that magnificence into a tiny body and then to step down into this density i just felt i i put that out because i felt i was speaking to so many other light workers at the time who were really feeling it was such a challenge for them to hold space for others and to um hold space for themselves uh, and i think every one of us has felt that over the past two years at one point or another that we're kind of coming to the end of our tether but the good thing is you know, because we've all come here to do a particular job with this ascension that we're going through, sometimes we, one of us can step back and the other one can step forward because we are a team and we, we forget that we don't have to carry it all ourselves all the time. You know, we are there to support one another, but it is a hard slog. I tell you, when I go home, the first thing I'm doing is I'm making a cocktail, an etheric cocktail, and I'm putting my feet up, and I'm going for I'm going for a little holiday somewhere in the cosmos. And um, I'll think I'll think about about coming back once the whole ascension is complete, <laughs> so I can enjoy the fruits of the labour that we've all kind of put time and effort into. Mm. Well, the second one is this one here. Uh, I thought. Um, this speaks so, I don't know, so strongly to anybody and everybody, doesn't it? Well, yeah, it does. I mean, we tend to forget 
that we have a plethora, you know, a whole entourage that come in with us. And, and many light workers and healers uh, don't actually know how many are on their team and how much support is there from the different aspects of them themselves, from their monadic self and, you know, everything, the I am presence, the, the higher self, and stepping down and down and down into the spirit that's now in this body and how complex that is as well. But we do come in with such an entourage with us and we tend to forget that we can call on them and we can tune into them and we can ask for support because we're in service. I mean, we are the, the foot soldiers, as far as I'm concerned. <clears throat> we're on the ground doing the work and they're, you know, there to support us. So we need to, we need to, to ask them to, to come in and, and do that. Because obviously, as you know yourself, they're not going to infringe on us and our, our um, free will. Well, it's a bit like, um, here we go, Star Trek, isn't it? It's like, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The, the prime directive is not into a fear, but I mean, um, <laughs> the question really at the end of the day is you've got to ask, isn't it? So if you ask, then they'll turn up. Yeah, yeah. And learn how to 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 work with them. Um, sometimes people tend to, when, when they first get into the this whole arena, the spiritual arena, and you're explaining how to connect with your spirit team, your guys or your cosmic team or whatever it might be, um, you have to learn how they how their language works you know how they communicate they don't communicate in the same way that we do they do communicate tr through telepathy and sometimes through direct clear audience but it's highly unusual and you know not very often so you have to learn that they communicate through signs and symbols and then when you when you've kind of built up the relationship and made it a bit stronger it becomes so much clearer when they're connecting with you you know, I know when my team are connecting with me because it comes in through the left hand side and I can feel it very differently. You know, so it's like anything. It's like a muscle that has to be strengthened. Um, but but they are there, you know, but you need to, to put the, the groundwork in and the legwork in and, and work with them as they lower their vibration and we rise, raise ours. Mm. So practice makes perfect, doesn't it? Well, it makes a lot of mistakes, Jeff. <laughs> Learning experiences. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, how good, how good are you at manifesting a car park then? A car park? Mm. Why would I want to manifest a car park? I'd rather have the car. <laughs> well, I've already taken on that you've already got the car. So if you've got the car, then it's just a matter of you've got to go and find that car park so you can park right out in front of the shop. Fair enough, yeah, fair enough. Actually, I've, I've, I don't know if you found this, but I found that manifestation has really sped up a lot. You know, it's gotten really, really fast in the last couple of years. Um, I was just saying this to a friend of mine that you have to be so careful of what you're focusing on, you know, um, because, you know, being aware of the the shadow aspects of your thoughts, I think is quite important because as we're going through a period when the shadows are coming up both at a planetary level um, and individually as well as entities on this planet. So we're working through our shadow aspects. And I just became very conscious of that recently. A friend of mine put out a post and it was something to do with um, the shadow aspect. And I just thought, crikey, yeah, you know, we're manifesting at such like speed of light just at the minute that being aware of what you're putting out, your thoughts, your, you know, what, what you're saying, what you're putting out to the world is then being met by that vibration and is then set to manifest. Uh, and I think that could also be part of the self-responsibility aspect of that, of this whole thing as well, because we are in a point in our evolution where we are learning to step into our sovereignty and we're learning to really take responsibility for ourselves. Like we are our own leaders. So we're learning to become our own leaders because that's our birthright. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, you had this one here, which I I really loved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know that one. That one kind of uh, stuck out to me as well. Yeah, I really love that one myself. Yeah, well, yeah. it's nice to 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 throw a few kind of um, you know love bombs in everybody's direction when you're meditating. <laughs> well, you don't realize how you know, like shine your light, isn't it? So how 
Yeah. Yeah. Don't hide your light under a rock, but um, shine like a lighthouse. So um, yeah, bring out that smile, isn't it? That's a inner smile. But <laughs> I look at that and I thought, oh my god. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I love that one myself. Yeah. And you're right. You know, we do need to allow ourselves to, to shine. We have we've we've suppressed ourselves, you know, for such a long time. And we've bought into that whole concept of I'm not good enough and I'm not worthy. And this is all going. That's very outdated. It's a very outdated paradigm. And it's OK to step into your weirdness, if you like, or your um, differences and be different. Somebody recently said wanted me to do something that I felt very, very strongly against doing because it wasn't right for me. And this person ended up um, saying, well, you know, you're the only person who isn't doing it and you're the odd one out. <laughs> Said, like that's an insult to me that's not an insult I've always been the odd one out that doesn't make any difference at all you know be unique be unique in 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 who you are be engage in your diversity engage in your uniqueness hey um before we went on the airwaves here I said to you I still got no idea what I want to be when I grow up so yeah. uh, is that part of the human condition of um, coming in here and learning what it's like to be human? And then you got to break free. That song, you know, learn to break free and then realize just like a, a mighty oak tree, it, it's seed, um, it's got to take a while to germinate. And then all of a sudden it's got a, a program in it and that tree, that seed becomes a massive oak tree. So is that what we're doing at the moment? We're breaking, breaking free and we're actually realizing the, the game of monopoly, if you want to call it as such, you know, this whole world of capitalism and consumerism and all that stuff is, we've had enough of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think as a species, we've had enough of it, but definitely as um, spiritual entities who have been reincarnating onto this planet over and over again, as, you know, as humanity, we've had enough and we've been so suppressed for such a long time and we didn't know we were being suppressed. And this is where the awakening is happening, obviously. And of course, we have a lot of assistance and help. There are a lot of us here from other places in, in the universe who have come to assist with this. You know, I, I did a video on my Facebook page about a year ago. I think it was the, the beginning of 2021. And I said, you don't know when you've been living in something that is really filthy and dirty if you're born into that. And I said, can you imagine if you're born into a swimming pool that somebody has like chucked lots and buckets of dirt into that swimming pool? You don't know when you're born into it that you're, live, that you're in filth and you're in all of this dirt. And what we're going to be seeing happening, which is, is happening at the moment, is we're going to see the, the, the layers of filth and the layers of dirt that we have, the conditioning that we have been, that we've had imposed on us up until this point, we're going to see those being removed. But we have to see it for ourselves. So we have to see the levels of corruption get to so such a, a, a deep, dark level that even the deepest of sleepers can see that there's something wrong here with what's being shown to me, what's on display to me. The soul, and I, I encourage people to go with that kind of inkling, that inner voice that says, I know what's being presented to me. Yeah, I've been going along with this. However, there's something here telling me this isn't right, this isn't right. So I said, um, things are gonna get a lot worse, folks, before they get better. <laughs> and, and it is gonna continue like that, in that vein for a few more years, but, there's a lot of good stuff coming as well. It's not, you know, I think we're really coming into a turning point in 2022. I feel that that's, there's going to be a shift in 2022 and hopefully we'll be kind of rising again after that and beginning to see other structures being dismantled, but also seeing the rebuilding or not rebuilding, actually, I'll correct myself, the building of new structures on the planet that we haven't seen before so this is very very exciting for us to be here at this time however it's very challenging as well because we're in between like literally in between two civilizations at the moment you know we haven't fully left one and we haven't fully gone into the next so it is a challenging time particularly for anybody who isn't of your kind of 
take on things and my take on things, our ilk. So um, there's, there's a lot coming to the surface for them. There's a lot of trauma. And we saw that in the, the lockdowns, uh, particularly the first one. Once people got bedded into the idea that it wasn't going to be a two week lockdown or a three week lockdown that they had been originally told, they, they, they lost that feeling of the illusion of control that, that we have. Um, and we saw a lot of people going into trauma. We saw suicides. We saw all sorts of, of stuff coming up for people. Um, because we, we we began sitting with ourselves and we began sitting with our shadow aspects. And for anybody who's never gone through that before or who's never done a, a long, dark night, night of the soul, never had that type of experience, it's very, very hard for them. Very hard. So they need a lot of support. Yeah, we also do. We need to support one another. But they they are, I think, particularly vulnerable. Uh, Beck and... Um... Belfast there, I mean, um, is the personal growth um, way of life pretty strong? More in the Republic rather than Belfast. Uh, when I first moved here about eight or nine, nine years ago, I was quite surprised. Belfast is a very clean city, very nice city. It's very, very small though, and it's quite parochial. So a lot of people know each other's business which was very unusual for me because I'm used to living and traveling, you know, up until that point on my own. So to move to a city where kind of people wanted to know your business was quite unusual. Um, and there was, there's a lot of religions here. In fact, there are so many religions that I hadn't even heard of. And there's like a religion. They would say in, in Dublin, where I'm from, in the Republic, there's a pub on every corner of the street. In, in Northern Ireland, there's a, there's a church or some sort of, you know, temple on every corner of the street. So it's kind of, it's getting there. People are opening up a bit more now. When I first moved here, I remember somebody telling me that she knew of a girl who had been run out of Belfast for being a witch because she was a healer and a psychic. <laughs> so that's the way of the thinking at that time. But I've seen quite a bit of progression over the last nine years since I've been here anyway. I've seen people opening up a lot more and more willing to engage and ask questions because I think people are just, it, well, I mean, in general, all over the, the globe, people are, are waking up anyway. And they are asking questions. They're, they're not as frightened. So whether it's spiritual development or personal development, um, yeah, they are kind of coming into that arena now. Whereas we might have looked at kind of the likes of Bob Proctor and all that personal development years and years ago, they're becoming more open to it now. And um, it's it's great to see because it's very fast moving for them as well. Once they get onto that path, it's, it's a very fast trajectory that they're on. Whereas when I was knocking around doing all my trainings, it might take me three years to do a set of training and go through the whole experience and the, you know, the, the, the good and bad of it all. And now I'm seeing with my own students that they're coming on and they are learning what I would have taken me three years to learn. They're experiencing it and mastering a lot of it within six months to a year. So we can see that things have really kicked up in pace with regard to, but that's to do with the light coming in, the photonic light, and you know everything is going up in frequency. Well, you know, every um, apprentice has had to have a master in it. So I mean, mm. I know that um, in the early days, their self mastery was the the path, and you didn't have physical teachers to mentor you like as you would if you're a carpenter or a motor mechanic, where you had someone previously there to guide you and take you through your apprenticeship. Your self mastery was dealing with um, the unseen, the, the yeah. uh, helping you with their hands and ideas and suggestions. I mean, I go for a walk in the morning, and I quite often would think um, about something, and then all of a sudden I'll I'll see a feather just mm -hmm. right there, just as I'm about to put my foot on it. There's a feather, so I seem to get a collection of feathers as I walk around, and quite often I watch other people going for the walk in this area where there's a 
basically a forest. But they're work, walking around with headphones and they, I, those little iPod things in their head. And I'm thinking, aren't you listening to nature? I mean, you can hear those kookaburras and you hear the crows and you can hear the butcher birds and, um, and the magpies. And, and sometimes I just go past it and I say, good morning, you know, and they stop. You can see these birds stop and have a look at you thinking, oh, what's going on here? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> but it's just acknowledging, you know, there's sentient beings around you and it's just, you know, it's not whimsical, but it's just saying, um, I'm acknowledging you, you know, and um, I think that's mm. part of this journey, you know, like, I'm not interested in going to the pubs or the clubs, I'm not interested in all that kind of stuff, I've done that. Do I need to go travel? I like to go out every weekend and get out in nature. Um, and I think that's really been good for my whole mental, emotional, physical health, getting out and about. Mm. Uh, and certainly not watching mainstream oh. television stations or newspapers, which is just given a narrative, which is one sided, one opinion. And, and yeah. I realised by switching that off, I'm actually listening to myself when I say listen to myself, I'm listening to my intuition, my own fluidity about, oh, that's a good idea. You know, so you listen to that, those little impulses that are coming through and you think, oh, that's a good idea. I'll try that in business, you know, and I'll change my uh, approach on the phone when I'm talking to someone or just something, just little things that do tweaking in it. So um, I th mm -hmm. I found that's been the benefit of this uh, so-called narrative that's been promoted and pushed uh, for a certain agenda, you know. Yeah, no, I would agree with you, actually, because I think it, um, in a lot of ways it's had the opposite effect than it than was intended. And people have learned more about their own discernment, which is crucial. We, we can't follow gurus. We can't follow teachers. We need to find the inner voice, um, the inner self, the inner essence, connect with that and um, build a relationship with self. With that aspect of self and value what you're saying to yourself value what's coming up the decisions the ideas as you said for business and you know one of the great things is i'm seeing more and more people turning off the television and you know not reading the newspapers and this is fantastic because i haven't watched television for years but when I told people two or three years ago, like, yeah, no, I don't watch TV, it was like shock horror. <laughs> you know? But how do you find out the news? And I said, well, I have sources to find out new real news, but there's a reason why adverts work. It's a, there's a reason why it's a multi-billion dollar industry. It's because people sit down in front of these televisions and they allow themselves to go into the hypnotic state and the same ad is run over and over and over again in between programs because it works. So people don't realize sometimes that they are actually being hypnotized and conditioned to have a certain mindset because, you know, as I said, it's a multi-billion do dollar industry. So, you know, they're taking these techniques and using them elsewhere, i.e. mainstream media news and you know programs of that ilk as well because these techniques work they know very 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 well how to program somebody's subconscious so if you're in fear every day and you're sitting and you're anxious every day and worried about this new variant or whatever else that they're coming out with you have really nobody else to blame but yourself if you're switching on the tv or reading negative news in a newspaper constantly. Take your power back. Take self-responsibility. Choose what you place your attention on because what you place your attention on, you connect with that frequency and you bring it into your reality and you, you create it then in your reality and you manifest it. So I think definitely that, that inner space and that quietness that we've all experienced over the last couple of years has been a great lesson in being inside and being with yourself and discerning and trusting your decisions trusting what comes up you don't have to go and ask somebody else constantly and that's what we're all learning now is that well actually what i the conclusion i have come to is 
may be different to yours, but it's of value to me. And this is the, the, the path I'm going to go down with it. Yeah. Hey, um, in radio, um, I'm going to use the radio as an analogy. <clears throat> we broadcast out and um, we have... Uh, well, we have a transmitter and the person who's actually listening is, has the receiver. So um, that technique that you're just saying, how, you know, put the ads in and all that stuff. I mean, Joseph Goebbels, you know, from the German yeah. Nationalist Party, I mean, he kept it simple, tell the lie and keep it simple and that people acknowledge it as a truth. Lord Machiavelli was <clears throat> divide and rule. You know, if you don't have an enemy, create one. But in radio, TV, we'll go with radio, we broadcast out of the transmitter, so the person who's actually got the radio will be the receiver. But what we actually seen is a, a human, where I, it's the word in our industry is called transceiver. So in other words, you receive the signal that's been broadcast out. So mainstream media have actually broadcasted out. You become the receiver, but then you turn around and you become the transmitter. So that's hence the word transceiver. So you then transmit what the mainstream news has been telling you to all your family and friends. So you're trying to get your network of people to come and believe this is your team, this is your tribe. And it's a very subtle way of manipulating um, your community by turning everybody into transceivers. So the game plan is switch off those guys. Don't give them any airspace. Don't become transmitters and receivers. Don't become transceivers, but basically start listening to your own heart and you'll find that you'll start meeting your own tribe. Um, just mm -hmm. uh, as you walk around in life itself, you'll you'll, you'll meet like-minded people. They'll, they'll open up and have a chat, even if it's at the shopping centre checkout, you know, or just out in the car park and you might save a shopping trolley from damaging your car, but, you know, you've just done something that engenders and starts a conversation. Yeah, and we're like that um, energetically as well because because of the electromagnetic field around the physical body, the aura around the body. So we're receiving energy in through that and we're holding that information and just being around another person is organically transmitting information to them as well. So it does work on a variety of levels. It works on very subtle levels. But, I mean, it's all on subtle levels, but it it it. Uh, it, it programs the subconscious but actually programs the energetic field of the person too and this is why it's important for us to you know try and cleanse those energies and get high higher frequency energies into our electromagnetic field around the body so that we're producing higher emissions if you like and transmitting those to others you know, so we're communicating at the energetic level all the time anyway. So let's communicate something that's much higher frequency. Of course. Yeah. And this is what leads me on to this um, image that you've got on your um, Facebook site. I, was, I thought yeah. this was a very important uh, topic that we could talk about. And we actually found it without even realizing it. <laughs> yeah. That's, um, that's something I um, I'm, I'm very hot on actually is energy cleansing and energetic sovereignty. So as a healer, I became quite aware. Uh, let me step back a bit. So I did shamanic training with a, the with a shaman 18 years ago. I started doing my sets of trainings with this person. And I learned through my shamanic training uh, quite a bit about having a foot in both worlds, but 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 mastering in order to master, you have to understand both sides. So we're in a universe of duality and polarity, and a lot of the spiritual teachers are all about love and light, and on, only look at the light and master the light. But you can't master it without knowing the opposite. So. I, I was very taken with this concept when I was doing my shamanic training. And that was the first time that I became quite consciously aware of how we can be infiltrated, how our energetic field can become infiltrated with, without, from lower density energies and entities. 
And if we don't know about that, how easily we can be manipulated without having any awareness of it. So I, I became more and more and more aware of this as time went on. And then I started seeing these situations that we're looking at here with the auric field with my own clients. So being able to detect what's called a tear, an auric tear. So an auric tear can happen if somebody has an operation, for example, that, that, that can cause an auric wound or an auric tear. Now, the, the energy of that person will then leak out through that auric tear and other things can actually get in and attach to the person as well. And I know this to be true because I have seen these and I have removed them. And I had an attachment myself for 10 years without knowing it until he was being removed and he was leaving. Um, and that there was nothing nefarious about him. He was a human entity, a human spirit who I had picked up. I was 24 and I didn't really know. I was only getting into this. I was only beginning my journey with, with all of this. And I was in a boyfriend's house. And it was an old coach house in London. And it was about 300 years old. And I was staying there for the weekend. I was living in Dublin and I was studying. I was at college. So I would bring my books over and he would take a couple of days off and then he'd go back to work and I would study because I had exams coming up. So I was sitting in this, it was an old coach house. So it was converted and it was modernized, but it had like original beams and it was beautiful, beautiful home. And I became aware of a presence in the, in the place, in the house. And I was sitting there with my books and I was studying away and it just became overwhelming. So much so that I packed up my books and I moved to a different room. And I got a little bit freaked out as you do. So I remember going home to Dublin and speaking to my parents and saying, what do I do about this? You know, I don't know what to do about this. And they said, oh, it's grand. Holy water, that's all you need. Get the priest to bless the water and bring some holy water over and bless the house. I went, Grant, that'll do the job. So so the next time I was going over, I did that and it didn't do anything. <laughs> and same scenario again. I was studying and had to take up the books, move to a different room. And then one night I was in the, the bedroom and I got very, uh, my boyfriend actually at the time was snoring really badly. So I got up and I went down to the spare room at the other end of the house. And I got into bed in the spare room and then I turned around and this man is standing in the corner with a moustache and a hat. And I thought, OK, no, this isn't good. I'm not happy about this. Head under the covers type of job. Now. What I found out was what I felt from him because I'm an empath. So my, my, my feeling was that there was nothing threatening. There was nothing to be fearful with regard to he was going to try and do anything to me or anything like that. It wasn't like that. I just felt overwhelming sadness from this man. Um, and I wanted to, to help him. But there was nothing. I, I wasn't trained as a healer at that time. But I knew what my senses, you know, my spidey senses were, were picking up. And it was only years, it was 10 years later that I was in, um, I was having a reading. My sister was doing a tarot card reading for me. And it was actually during the tarot card reading that I became aware of this man that I had seen 10 years prior. And myself and my sister literally crossed him over. And why he had attached to me was because he knew way before I knew that I was a healer and that I would be able to assist him. Now, by the time he was leaving, I did have a lot more experience and I did know how to cross him over. And he was very, very grateful. But he had been attached to my energy for 10 years. So that, you know, was being fed on for 10 years. So I was losing that energy for that length of time. Um, and he wasn't a nefarious entity. He was just a very sad man who for some reason had not crossed over when his time came and was very grateful when he got an opportunity to cross over. Shades mm. of Patrick Swayze, eh? And the ghost. Yeah, a bit like that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at, least, at least it didn't sing I'm, I'm Henry the Eighth, I am. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, they didn't have the enjoyment of the whole pottery scene, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they can then. Um, so, so coming back to the original point. So what I um, do is I, I help people like I, I'll help clients to learn how to cleanse their aura themselves and how to strengthen it, how to put guards up or shielding up. There are quite a few teachers who don't believe in shielding. They feel like, you know, you're, you're drawing attention to the, the negative, if you like. I disagree with that because, well, OK, let me retrace my steps. To me, that's somebody who hasn't experienced the other side of the coin. Um, but I think if you're going to, to, to be of service to your clients and if you're going to be of service to your students, and if you know that this stuff is out there and this does happen, uh, you, you have a duty to teach them how to see and know when there's a tear in, in somebody's aura, if you're working on them, uh, know if there's um, any dense energy in there. So we have a thing called auric mucus. So auric mucus can be hanging around the auric field and can be taken out quite easily, actually. And um, then we have etheric parasites and we have etheric attachments. And these things that can be slippery little suckers, you know, they can get right into the organs and wrap around the organs um, or hang around the chakras, the, the energy centers and, and cause havoc in the body and create discomfort, disease, um, mental health issues, all sorts of things, emotional issues. So I help people to know how to detect these. So I, I teach my students how to know when they're coming across these and then how to work with them. Either they either are going to connect and speak to the entity and ask it to leave or they're going to remove it forcibly, depending on what kind of density it is, what type of uh, entity it is, really. Um, but cleansing and strengthening the aura is crucial for light workers at the moment. Because as you quite rightly know, there is a bit of a battle going on on the planet. And um, we can get targeted. Not all light workers are targeted. I was one of the unfortunates who was. So I've learned all of this from experience. No teacher taught me this, except for the shaman, my, my shamanic teacher. Um, none of my other teachers spoke about it or would even look at it because it was, oh no, it was fear of, of looking at stuff that they didn't want to look at, um, which would make me question, well, how much stuff within yourself of how, how much of your own shadow aspects are you not looking at? You know, because we always, as healers, we need to be clearing ourselves constantly because our job is to transmute energy. That's what we're here to do. So we have to have energy moving and changing and shifting and transmuting all the time. So it's important. This is an important part of the work to know how to, to cleanse and ground and bring energy in um, in a very constructive way and transmute the negative that is there um, because it is there and we can't keep ignoring it pretending it's a fairy tale it is there if i'm going to do i'm not going to go in with a load of love and light on my back if i need a sword you know you have to again we're coming back to discerning there are certain situations where you you will you will use that aspect and there are certain situations where you really have to go in with a with a hard ass attitude into the the, the work that you're about to undertake because it's not pretty you know um so yeah so so cleansing the aura and, and making sure that everything is as clean as it can be will really serve you really 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 serve you and keep that other stuff out or if it comes at you and even like the negativity from things like the tv it won't you won't it won't sink in you know you can keep that barrier there and it'll be to be a barricade between you and it you know and keep it keep it out i'm hearing you so mm. is, that, is that what led you to um quantum light pod healing is that how that came about okay quantum light pod healing is quite um quite an unusual thing so when i i started having having experiences at the age of five with entities and uh, this created uh, like poor sleep and fear of going to sleep and all of that stuff, which then turned into insomnia. Um, and so that went on. So that was one aspect of, of, of stuff and the whole spiritual area. 
so I've had three awakenings in my life. One when I was 21 and then um, another one when I went through very long dark night of the soul after my shamanic training i really went into quite a shamanic sickness and then my most recent one was two years ago where i had what i call a starseed awakening which was something that i didn't even really know much about i had heard the term starseed but i really didn't know what it was about um i'd heard people talking about ets and aliens and different planets and I thought it was really interesting it was quite it was fascinating and I totally resonated what what they were saying but I didn't take it as a personal thing as in this is something that I have a real passion about or anything like that so I was in meditation on a Saturday afternoon on my sofa 12 o'clock in the day and I'm in meditation and suddenly I feel myself being whooshed around, swirled around in my body. And I, I know I was inside my body because I could feel that my body was on the outside. I'm going to try and explain this as best I can because it's very hard to explain. So I knew I was inside my body. And then I was going through these kind of vortices and um, tunnels, if you like. And they had different colors and there was a lot of blue. I remember there being a lot of blue, a lot of kind of sparkles and silver and white. And then I'd land and I'd be stationary and I'd have a look around and th there was one setting where I was in a playground and then suddenly I was up and I was gone again and I started pushing around, pushing around and I remember thinking, God, this is really weird. This is because I was totally lucid. I wasn't asleep at all. I was totally conscious. And I was thinking, God, am I astral traveling? What's going on here? You know, it was, it was very unusual. And this went on and on and on. And I got quite accustomed to it then. I got, I got accustomed to the feeling of feeling like I'm tumbling all over the place and moving all over the place and then landing somewhere and having to look around and then going off again. <laughs> but the final time it happened, uh, wherever I landed, there were three entities above me. And it, there seemed to be like a, a veil or a gauze between me and them because I couldn't see details of their faces, but I could see the shape of their faces. And I instinctively knew that they were a medical team of some description. They were a medical team. They were there to do something on my body. I didn't feel any fear, didn't feel any threat. And I felt, um, I felt something being taken from my arm. I felt, you know the way if you get something like stuck in your hand or stuck in your in your arm and it's being pulled out and pulled out and pulled out and you're waiting for that point where you feel the pain as it exits the skin. Well, it was it was like that. I could feel a pull. I could feel pressure and, and a pull coming from the skin. And I was waiting for that moment where it would actually exit and I'd go, ah, that really hurts. But then it just came out and it didn't hurt. And I remember being amazed. I was I, oh my God, it's not my physical body. So that's when I had a realization that this is something else that's going on. And I thought, okay, this is this is my light body. Something, they're doing something with my light body. And I know that they took two other objects out, but I can't remember where that was from. It's just the one that was in my left arm. I was very aware of that coming out uh, and going through that whole procedure. And it was at that time that a friend of mine, so in that same week, a friend of mine contacted me and asked me if I would do Reiki online with him. And I said, yeah, I will. We made an arrangement. And the day before I decided I'm going to just go into meditation and I'm going to just tune into his energy because I wanted to see what was going on and where things were at. So I'd be kind of prepared for the next day. But when I went into meditation, I was met by a spirit guide, a new spirit guide, who was standing there with this mechanism. Uh, and it looked like a pod. And that's why it's called quantum light pod healing. So I was looking at this and I said, what, I, what is this? I, I don't know. I've never seen this before. So it was, it was like um, lots and lots and lots of light, streams of light, like threads of light, all crisscrossing one another. And they said to me, or this guy said to me, put him inside of this. We're going to show you how to use this. So I placed my friend inside of this on the etheric level, on the, the, the quantum level, like this isn't physical. This isn't a physical machine. 
and they started instructing me as how to use it and what to do and to bring certain things out of the, the pod itself and attach it to different parts of his body. So I did that. And the next day I asked him, I told him what had happened. I told him that I he went into meditation. I went in to check on his, his energy, see what was going on. And this is what happened. Do you mind if I do this type of healing on you? Because I'm going to follow the guidance of this new this new um, fella, this new spirit guide who's pitched up in meditation. <laughs> and um, he says, oh, that's grand. That's grand. So we did two sessions, actually. And the funny thing is, he's a medium as well. And he was seeing the same things. So he was able to describe to me the things that I was seeing when I was working on him. So that was really interesting. So I did two uh, healing sessions with him. And the condition that he had come to me with completely disappeared. And he got, um, he got a, a call from the hospital to say that it, it was all clear and he had gone into remission. Um, if that's the right word. Basically, he had been very, very, very sick and um, it, it just disappeared. So I thought, there's something going on with this energy. So then I asked other people if they would volunteer, would they, if they would let me work on them as, as volunteers. And in return, obviously, they receive healing sessions. And the reports back that I was getting was it wasn't just clearing up health conditions and assisting with health conditions and um, removing pain. It was also helping in people's businesses, which I didn't expect. Um, there was one uh, woman who was having terrible problems with her business. It was a startup and she couldn't shift. She didn't know what to do. So when I went in to the session, I spoke to the, the energy of the, the business. The, the entity of the business, because the business is an entity itself, you know, the spiritual aspect of it. And then I did the quantum light pod healing with the entity of the business. And then she came back. She had, I can't remember if it was two or three sessions. Um, everything started shifting. She was doing a job in England that she did not want to do. And she had to travel back and forth every six weeks. And she did not want to do it. She didn't want to continue doing it. Um, and... I'd say about six or seven months later, she had quit that job. She was back home in Ireland and she um, is now fully working away with her own business and things are moving beautifully for her. Now, I've seen that with her and I've seen it with other people as well who wanted to, to change direction. Um, what it seems to do, Jeff, is it's a, it's it's very transformational i'm still observing the effects of it myself i'm still learning and and the, and the guys are still teaching me new aspects of it and teaching me different things about it um and how to use it in different ways um but what i've noticed is for everybody it's transformational in one way or another what it seems to do is it, it gets people onto it's like so if somebody is off kilter or off their um the correct path, it pulls them onto the, not pulls them, it gets them onto the path. Usually in the first session, there's a, a clearing and there's an activation of some description. Because I've seen these activations taking place in people's throat chakras in particular, um, in other chakras as well, third eye, but in the throat um, and the heart, but the throat has been a big one. And um, yeah, it, 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 it gets them onto the correct trajectory, it gets them onto their purpose work, gets them onto their mission, and then they just go, they fly. They just go so fast. Uh, so the QLP, and, and that name, by the way, Jeff, Quantum Light Pod Healing, it was my team who decided that it was going to be called Quantum Light Pod Healing, and I said to them, oh, can I please drop the pod? It sounds so naff, you know, Quantum Light Pod Healing. <laughs> and they said, Ah uh, no no no! You have to keep that. That's important. So that's why it's called quantum light body. <laughs> so that was the the birth of the QLP healing energy, and it's going from strength to strength. It really, really is. So I'm delighted it's been it's been given to me, and I have I have done a bit of research to try and find somebody else who has received this modality because it's a new healing modality, and I haven't found anybody using the light pod. Um, so. So if there's anybody out there who knows another healer who's been given the light pod to use, put them in touch with me because I'd love to receive a session from them because I don't even know what it feels like myself because I haven't had one. Just know other people have been transformed by it. 
so there you go so um i take it that the, the gentleman who came and saw you uh, it was part of your experiment mm. did he physically come to you or did you surrogately um send naps and healing to him no it was done on zoom i do i do the qlps specifically on zoom and i'll tell you why because for some reason i get more information about the person, about what's going on, what's going on on their body or going on in the etheric level. Because I, I always have a pad and a pen beside me when I'm doing the healing. And I write down everything that I see during the session and I write down everything that the energy clears for the person. I also write down any areas of pain that I've been drawn to and I'll confirm and say, you know, there was a lot of energy going into your feet. I, you, you know, I could really feel you have a problem with your feet at the moment and then the person will confirm that or whatever it might be, headaches or whatever. Um, but for some reason, I don't know if it's because I'm in my own comfort zone here and the other person, wherever they are living in the world, they're in their own comfort zone and we're doing it online. So everybody's chilled. It, and, and also... I'm stationary, so if I'm doing hands-on healing, I'm standing for a longer period of time and I'm moving around the person. Whereas when I'm doing the QLP healing, I'm sitting there with my pad and my pen and I'm doing different clearings with my hand and my new wand, I have to show you my new, my new wand. This wand came all the way from Ohio. There was a lovely healer over there, a lovely master who makes these and who came across my work online. Her name is Yvonne. And she reached out and she said, I really want to make you a wand and I'm going to send it over to you. <laughs> so it, I received it about a week and a half ago and I started using it and it's very, very powerful. So I'll be using my hands because um, sometimes there'll be psychic surgery going on um, or there'll be activations that come in for the client uh, or I'll be removing uh, energy with my hands, I'll be going anti-clockwise to remove it, and then I'll be putting in new gorgeous positive energy, so I'll be going clockwise. Um, or if there's any, if there are any etheric attachments or any um, what I call parasites, if they're in there and they're lodged inside the person, I'll go in and I will remove them as well. And then afterwards, I sit down with the client and I tell them everything that I read in their energy everything that came up for healing. Um, I was adding tarot cards in at the beginning, at the end of the healing sessions, but I kind of abandoned that because I get so much energy, or get so much information from the from the, the person's energy anyway, that they kind of have nearly a full reading by the end of the healing session. So it's kind of gone from strength to strength and I'm just following it. <laughs> letting it show me where, where it wants me to go, where it wants to, to lead me. So that's the QLP sessions. And yeah, they're on Zoom, done on Zoom. Oh, very good. So if I just mm -hmm. put this, um, when you go and put Facebook up, I mean, it's got facebook.com and it's got all the things and it's got about 15 blade like, digits and all that stuff. And then it comes to your name. I thought, I'm not going to put that up that people might be able to see that. So if they just go, type on facebook put your name in there um yeah. and it comes up holistic therapy therapist and teacher so if they see that while they're on facebook and they can click on um uh, and they'll get something like uh this yeah so oh, yeah see. that's my facebook page yeah uh -huh. yeah, yeah yeah so um i see you when well, you're doing the tango here mate you're a bit of a dancer are you oh i was yeah I, uh, I used to love tango and I, I will get back into it. I fell in love with tango when I was in my early 30s. It was the most and is the most incredibly graceful and um, therapeutic dance you could ever do. I, I fell in love with it. I used to dance salsa and tango. So I was out four nights a week dancing one or dancing the other. And then I went to Argentina and I did some training over there and did a few get on stage stuff um performances and then started teaching it did four years teaching it in in dublin with my dance partner at that time and then moved to london and then moved to belfast and i haven't danced for mm. quite a while now so yeah time to get the old um high heels out of the closet i think 
a long stem, bloody red rose, isn't it? Well, this is it, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, they call it four play before bed, isn't it? Uh huh. <laughs> well, it gets your energy moving, doesn't it? Oh, it certainly does. I used to say to students when I was teaching it, if you can learn how to do a partner dance, but particularly with tango, if you can learn how to do tango, you will save thousands in psychotherapy and counselling fees because you work through so many issues, particularly around trust and trusting uh, the opposite sex because you're moving your chakras, you're moving your energy centres, particularly, you know, the upper and the lower because you're disassociating your body. So you have one part of your body moving over this side, the other other part, move, the lower part going in the opposite direction. So you are shifting the, the lower chakras and up right, up, right up until the heart. And in fact, there was a place, it was a Glasgow University, one of the universities in Scotland, um, they ran a study on it. I don't know what the outcome was, but I know that they were running a study on the therapeutic outcomes of Argentine tango. So, um, yeah, it, it, because also because you're dancing so closely, so it's very intimate dance but it's non-sexual. So it's a different way of people actually experiencing intimacy because in our society, we tend to only experience intimacy through sexual contact often or going into uh, deeper aspects of our spiritual uh, communication with ourselves, if you like, you know, so um, connecting with our, our, our inner selves or connecting externally to a member of the opposite sex or same sex, or whatever you're you're into yourself. But with with partner dancing, in particular Argentine tango, you can experience intimacy in a very different way, and it's very boundaried, and that's what I really liked about it. So you can be up close and personal with somebody, and there is full on respect from both parties. And I also love the way it brings the woman into her full feminine flow and the man into his full masculine flow and the masculine and the feminine are working in union in a way that you don't often see in society here because often you know one is trying to dominate the other or putting the other one down or undermining whereas in tangle it's two halves of the same unit coming together and honoring one another he can't dance without her and she can't dance without him and both of them have very very different roles in the dance but both of them need one another to complete the union of the dance and to complete the beauty of that and the creativity of it it's the most beautiful feeling to dance tango so i would advise anybody argentine tango not ballroom tango argentine tango it's very very sensual and um it's very boundaried as well so it might look very very sexy on tv but there is there are boundaries there excuse me and there are rules there and it's it's a wonderful way to socialize um meet new people and work through your own stuff on the dance floor as well hey um my personal story happened early last year when um this lady asked me if um would I like to go dancing? I said, well, uh, let me sleep on it and I'll ring me in the morning. What she didn't know was that a friend of mine had put on a, a ball on the Gold Coast in Queensland here some two years ago and he was going to do it again next year, but no one knew about it except us two. And, um, and when it actually happened, a lot of my mates, we all went off and got suits, <clears throat> old shoes. We got the whole, we we're, were schmick, you know what I'm saying? And... Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Two of the blokes, without telling us guys, went off for three months, twice a week, to get dancing lessons. So when it came to the ball, these guys bloody slayed it, you know. Yeah. So, so <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, hmm, um, I might take this girl up and go dancing with her. So when she rang the next day, I said, yeah, I'll do this, but <clears throat> I'll do that. But you got to tell me, you got to promise to me, you won't say that we've been out dancing. What? Because mm. next year, I want us to go. To the ball and i want us to bloody slay it <laughs> and i have to say i've i really thoroughly enjoyed it because it was just the one dancing part but i i found um eye contact that was just so resonating to be able to 
you know, look into the girl's eye and just look at it. And then you, the energy, that, as you spoke about, started to move and you really moved into it. It was only mm-hmm. towards the end of the year, because we had to learn four dances. He did a dance every uh, eight weeks. Uh, but then we had shutdowns and all that stuff. So when it came into October, we were allowed to do transitions to go from a different partner. And I fell in a heap because... The girls came in all different shapes and sizes and, and I got so used to dancing with that one female that um, and so I got my confidence and and the and the, the actual dancing teacher was a male who would tell the girls stop controlling step back yeah. let the male drive the car you go the male's got to drive the vehicle it was really so funny and then when I actually indicated to a couple of friends of mine one particular lady who's very very good dancer said Jeff eye contact with a woman don't look at your feet and you go off it'll just be brilliant and so um just taking some advice from people um was really really wonderful and I, i'll do it again um and was, i'll do it again if it was with one partner because i felt so um enthralled by it and it was confidence um, building too and energy oh, it was just amazing Oh, yeah. Uh, I used to see people coming in like some of them would be students, you know, 18, 19 years of age. Some of them were a lot older. And then there were people who were in their more advanced years who were uh, widowed. And you'd see them coming in and they'd start off arriving in jeans and a jumper the first week. And you'd see the confidence building and changing over the period. And six months later, all the women were dressed in the refinery. They wouldn't even dream about going to a, a Malonga, which is a, a tango social. Never dream about going there without all their refinery on, you know, and the men were in their suits. And really, it, it, gives, it gave people a great uh, sense of renewed pride. And I love that. I love yeah, that, yeah. Yeah. Well, they say clothes make it the men, isn't it? Oh, yeah, but the energy as well, because, you know, we are talking about gaining that confidence. Mm. That's the funny thing is, like, nobody cares what you do in the dance scene. Nobody cares what your job is. Nobody gives a damn what kind of salary you're on, what your title is. All they want to know is that you can dance and that you can lead. (laughs) If you can lead well, they'll have like 10 women queuing up to dance with you. you know? <laughs> yeah. Is he a good leader? Because the men, what they look out for is the, the height of the woman's heels. The higher the tango heel is, the better the dancer she is. So they'll be looking at the woman's heels and how she's holding herself. Is she leaning on him too much, taking too much away? Is she trying to control it? Because as you said, w- w- you see, women are so self-directed nowadays. So one of the biggest challenges when you start dancing Argentine tango is to actually allow a man to lead you. So that's one of the first lessons in trust and yeah, allowing, okay. yeah. letting go. Yeah, allowing somebody else to act and trusting that they will lead you correctly and not have somebody bang into you on the dance floor because they're the eyes and ears of, of the unit. You know, yeah. the woman is there with her eyes closed in heaven being moved around the dance floor. The legs flying up every so often. <laughs> God. I suppose the, the subject we're talking about dance is actually, you know, rather than just sit there and meditate, or um, well, you, you can do qigong or tai chi and other forms of um, martial art disciplines. But dancing was a, um, a really interesting concept of shifting energy, but also making it um, where you put in the other half, and it so you became one. I, I, I have to say, I was quite, um, I, I spoke to my brother about it and I said, you know, us males in Australia and New Zealand, we're sort of brought up, you know, males don't dance, you know, or don't sing. It's just not, you don't do it, you know. Um, yeah. And yet doing it last year for the first time was just um, an awesome experience. And I, I'm here talking on, a, on our show to explain to other fellows, you know, get up and have a go. I know, this is the thing. If fellas knew that they could really, you know, they'd be so admired and respected by women and women would want to be around them and dance with them just if they learned how to put a few steps together, you know. Gosh, I mean, if I was a fella now, I, that's exactly the first thing I'd be doing is getting myself down to the Arthur Murray Dance School or wherever, whatever it is, uh, and, and, and get some dance lessons, you know, and it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. 
he just said Arthur Murray. Is that over there in the um, in Ireland, UK? Is it? I think it was in the UK. Um, yeah. I don't think we have it in Ireland, but um, I think it was it's, in it was the here. UK. It's here in yeah. Australia. Same yeah. name, I think it's long country. gone now at this yeah. point. Yeah. Mm. All right. So, um, anybody watching and listening to the show now or in the repeats, is this is there something that I should actually ask you that you've always been, you know, thinking about it that you you know you'd like to tell an audience or tell people that on your journey you've you've um, you've tripped but you've picked yourself up and realised oh okay I've just learned something of some value that could be passed on. Uh, yeah, I guess. If you feel that something is happening to you, uh, regardless of if anybody else has experienced it or not, stick with yourself. Don't abandon yourself. Um, and I, I, I'm coming from a perspective where I abandoned myself for a very long time, particularly as a child, because I was being visited by entities for a very long time from the age of five. And um, I didn't know how to cope with it. And when I brought it up with my teachers over a period of, of many, many years, they didn't really know how to, to help me with it. And so I, I learned the importance of, first of all, what we were talking about earlier, discernment and trusting myself. And um, I learned the importance of shielding and guarding when you are doing deep spiritual work. It isn't all love and light, guys. It really, really isn't. There's a lot of stuff out there and it's not coming from fear. And I, I wondered whether to say this or not. Originally, it did come from fear. If I hadn't been frightened of the things that happened to me when I was much younger and all the way through my adult life until recent years uh, from the, the etherical, from the ethereal perspective um i wouldn't have come to a place where i know now how important it is for those of us who are doing energy work to be aware of when we're in our own energy and when there is something else coming at us that's trying to infiltrate and it is very real and i think we need to be aware of that and that is one of the things that i really I find it's 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 important, particularly in this time. Light workers need to be aware that they are shining a lot more brightly than they than we ever did in the past, and we need to be aware of our own power and how that can be th a threat to other people. And so, you look after your sovereignty. You look after what's yours. This is rightfully yours. OK, and you don't let anybody or anything else come in and infiltrate it. OK, so that's what I would say about that. But to me, that's important. Hey, um, just say our political leaders and our pharmaceutical companies and our pharmaceutical lobbyists, bankers, um, other business houses that have been swept up along with the media. Would you, um, how do I say it, um, send them love and light rather than, okay, how do I put it? So we're in a spiritual war and mm. energetically, if you were thinking, uh, if you, those, all those, those words that I just used for those particular professions, if we use the, a negative connotation to those people, we're actually broadcasting that signal to them and then they're picking it up and then they start to feel a bit more apprehensive and probably starting to dig in. Is there the principle of um, of the Christ principle of just send them love and love them seven times seven, 70 times or whatever the phrase was? Is it, would you... What are your thoughts about that subject? Yeah, that's a very different thing to what I was just talking about. Because no. what I was, yeah, because what I was talking about, let me have a think about that. I think, okay, so my first idea would be to do it as a group, as in a group meditation. Yeah. 
or a group transmission of energy, um, of positive light. Now, light is very powerful. However, sending love and sending light um, creates a connection with whatever you're sending it to between you and it. So, for example, if a, if a, if, if a nefarious entity pitches up in my bedroom, I will never send it love and light. I know love will um, very much have an effect on it because it can't bear to be around that. But I will never send it because by sending it, I'm creating a connection to it. And I don't want that. So I will expand my own inner love out and whatever is lower than that can't be in the presence of it, can't stand it. So I wonder if, so I would sp probably go down the route of um, more larger group meditations and expanding the light out to anywhere that it's needed rather than sending it specifically to a politician or leader or whatever. Uh, now, that, and that's not to say that when people do that, they're wrong. It's just, it's my preference not to have an energetic connection with that person um, or the, the, the possible creation of an energetic connection with them. So I would more likely expand myself out and expand my energy and my heart center out. I would go and sit in the heart center, connect to creator through the portal in the heart, and then expand the light out around the world, wherever it's needed. That would be the way I would do it, okay. rather than sending it. But everybody has their own way. Yeah, it's all good. Mm. All right, any other dumb question? Or no, I was gonna say dumb question. Is there anything else you need to ask? <laughs> Uh, I can't think of anything that you need to ask me. Okay, so, um, okay, one thing is, you've said you do Zoom, so people who are watching it, I see we've got a few people in the United States watching it, and of course in New Zealand and in mm -hmm. Australia here, and obviously in the UK. So obviously um, they can come through and get hold of you through your is it through your Facebook or your website? Yeah, you can get through to me um, via my website, which is uh, www. Yeah dpconnections.co.uk or through Avine Murray on Facebook and there's also a business page there that's Deep Connections so I am accessible through all of those yeah, mediums if you like so we're all different parts of the world we all have different currencies um, what's obviously you use in euros what, what would be or pounds isn't it yeah, in Northern Ireland pounds uh-huh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so what's the um, what would you what was your um, fee for your uh, professional services? It's sixty pounds for um, a QLP session, which is roughly about an hour and a half long. That comprises of uh, a reading of the energy, yeah. a clearing of the energy, and then the healing work itself. Oh, good. So if they're on Zoom, then you can just hit that record button. You can record the yeah thing for replay. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, okay. happy to do that. Yeah. Oh, oh, it's been so um, I'll just come back to that last, that beautiful one. You had um, that screenshot. Um, this one here, I think that's really important. We'll finish off with that one. I think it's, um, yeah. So you've just got to ask, don't you? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, going back to what we were saying, you just have to ask. That's it. Because there are, you know, there are legions of angelic entities out there. Absolute legions of them. Unemployed angels who are waiting to be called in. And they are, they are just brilliant, you know, because they're so high vibrational and they're so beyond all of the densities. You know, they're way beyond the 12th density, the way beyond the densities within our universe. And they're looking after... Well, some are assigned to us, to the earth, and then obviously there are others assigned to like Sirius and all these other uh, galaxies and star systems. And our ones, are, there, there's so, so many of them, and they're just waiting to be asked in to assist. So always feel, if you, if you feel like you're on your own or that you can't cope with something, bring in your guardian angel. Bring in, uh, ask Archangel Michael. I work with him all the time. He's fantastic. 
ask him to bring his legion of angels in. Raphael, Metatron, they are just such great, great guys to have around. They're fantastic. Um, and th this is their job. You know, this is, give them an, an occupation. That's what they want. <laughs> They've been assigned to the earth. <laughs> so they, uh, I would encourage people to bring in the, the guardians, bring in their own personal guardians, bring in their guides, their spirit guides. Begin forging a relationship with your spirit guides. If you don't know how to do that, go on YouTube, look it up. There are millions of people teaching it online there. And start connecting with your heart because it, it all begins with going into your own heart space. When I found out that the heart was actually a portal, what a big awakening that was. I was like, oh, let's sit in here for a while. Let's have a look around and see what happens. Next minute, I'm in with the creator. And, you know, you, go do these things. Have your own experiences. You know, don't wait for a teacher or a guru to tell you what's the right thing to do. You're your own guru. You're your own shaman. You're your own teacher. And trust and discern for yourself and trust what you get. Believe in yourself and walk and carve the path that you're here to carve out. And you'll be assisting humanity by doing that. Well, thank you very, very much. And uh, Andrina, uh, I'm sure you've been watching the show. It's uh, been a pleasure for you to organize this um, event. Is that right? <laughs> Avine, yeah, close enough. I'll let you Avine. away with it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very really good. All right. Bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. It was lovely. It was a pleasure.